I've had to say a good deal about prayer. And before going on to my main subject tonight, I'd like to deal with a difficulty some people find about the whole idea of prayer. Somebody put it to me by saying, I can believe in God all right, but what I can't swallow is this idea of him listening to several hundred million human beings who are all addressing him at the same moment. And I find quite a lot of people feel that difficulty. Hello again. Welcome back to our study of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Today we're starting a new section, and so a little summarization of where we've been over the, fast, over the last few lessons. So if you remember, this book is divided into four parts. The first part is foundational, and it has to do with right or wrong and the meaning of the universe. From there, we move to what Christians believe. From there, we move to Christian behavior. And today, we start our lessons on beyond personality. First steps in the Trinity. So this last section is different than all the other sections, and it basically has to do with doctrine and theology. So let's go ahead and start there. Again, thank you for sharing this time, and we'll move like we usually do. We read some, we stop, we discuss, and then we read some more. So again, the title of this section is Beyond Personality, or The First Steps in the Doctrine of the Trinity. Now, this subsection is called Making and Begetting. Everyone has warned me not to tell you what I'm going to tell you in this last book. They all say the ordinary reader does not want to theology. Give him plain, practical religion. I have rejected their advice. I do not think the ordinary reader is such a fool, fool. Theology means the science of God, and I think any man who wants to think about God at all would like to have the clearest and mo most accurate ideas about Him which are available. You are not children. Why should you be treated like one? In a way, I quite understand why some people are put off by theology. I remember once when I had been giving a talk to the Royal Air Force, an old, hard-bitten officer got up and said, I've no use for all that stuff, but mind you, I'm a religious man too. I know there's a God. I felt Him. Out alone in the desert at night, the tremendous mystery. And that's just why I don't believe all your neat little dogmas and formulas about Him. To anyone who's met the real thing, they all seem so petty and pedantic and unreal. Now, in a sense, I quite agree with that man. I think he probably had a real experience of God in the desert. And when he turned from that experience to the Christian creeds, I think he really was turning from something real to something less real. In the same way, if a man had once looked at the Atlantic from the beach and then goes and looks at a map of the Atlantic, he also will be turning from something real to something less real, turning from real waves to a bit of colored paper. But here comes the point. The map is admittedly only colored paper, but there are two things you have to remember about it. In the first place, it is based on what hundreds and thousands of people have found out by sailing the real Atlantic. In that way, it has behind it masses of experience just as real as the one you could have had from the beach. Only while yours would be a single glimpse, the map fits all those different experiences together. In the second place, if you want to go anywhere, the map is absolutely necessary. As long as you're content with walks on the beach, your own glimpses are far more fun than looking at the map. But the map is going to be more use than walks on the beach if you want to get to America. Now, theology is like the map. The map is based on the experience of hundreds of people who really were in touch with God, experiences compared with which any thrills or pious feelings you and I likely are to get on our own are very elementary and very confused. 
And secondly, if you want to get any further, you must use the map. You see what happened to that man in the desert may have been real and was certainly exciting, but nothing comes of it. It leads nowhere. In fact, that is just why a vague religion all about feeling God and nature and so on is so attractive. It's all thrills and no work, like watching the waves from the beach. But you will not get to Newfoundland by studying the Atlantic that way. And you will not get eternal life by simply feeling the presence of God in flowers or music. Neither will you get anywhere by looking at maps without going to sea. Nor will you be very safe if you go to sea without a map. In other words, theology is practical, especially now. Everyone reads. Everyone hears things discussed. Consequently, if you do not listen to theology, that will mean that you have no ideas about God. It will mean that you have a lot of wrong ones, bad, muddled, out-of-date ideas. For a great many of the ideas about God, which are trotted out as novelties today, are simply the ones which real theologians tried centuries ago and rejected. The popular, the popular idea of Christianity is simply this, that Jesus Christ was a great moral teacher. And if only we took his advice, we might be able to establish a better social order and avoid another war. But this is not new. You need not go even as far as Christ. If we did all that Plato or Aristotle or Confucius told us, we should get a great deal better world too than we do. But as you, soon as you look at any real Christian writings, you find they're talking about something quite different from this popular religion. They say that Christ is the Son of God, whatever that means. They say that those who give Him their confidence can also become sons of gods, whatever that means. They say that His death saved us from our sins, whatever that means. There's no good complaining that these statements are difficult. Christianity claims to be telling us about another world, about something behind the world we can touch and see. Now the point of Christianity, which gives us the greatest shock, is the statement that by attaching ourselves to Christ, we can become sons of God. One of the creeds says that Christ is the Son of God, begotten, not created. And it adds begotten by his Father before all worlds. We don't use the words begetting and begotten much in modern English. But everyone still knows what they mean. To beget is to become the father of, to create. What God begets is God, just as what man begets is man. What God creates is not God, just as what man makes is not man. That is why men are not sons of gods in the sense that Christ is. They may be like God in certain ways, but they're not things of the same kind. They're more like statues or pictures of God. As we know, we're made in the image of God. A statue has the shape of a man, but is not alive. In the same way, man has, in a sense, I'm going to explain, the shape or likeness of God, but he has not got the kind of life God has. Man only lives, but loves and reasons. Biological life reaches its highest known level in mankind. But what man in his natural conditions has not got is spiritual life, the higher and different sort of life that exists in God. We use the same word life for both, but if you thought that both must therefore be the same sort of thing, that would be like thinking that the greatness of space and the greatness of God were the same sort of greatness. In reality, the difference between the biological life and the spiritual life is so important that I'm going to give them two distinct names. The bi biological sort, which comes to us through nature, and which is always tending to run down and decay, so that it can only be kept up by incessant subsidies from nature in the form of air, water, food, is bios. The spiritual life, which is in God from all eternity and which made the whole universe, is zoe. Bios 
has to be sure a certain shadowy or symbolic resemblance to Zoe, but only the sort of resemblance there is between a photo and a place, or a statue and a man. A man who changed from having bios to having Zoe would have gone through such a change as a statue which changed from being a carved stone to being a real man. And that is precisely what Christianity is about. The world is a great sculpture shop. We are the statue, and there's a rumor going around the shop that some of us are someday going to come to life. The crux of this reading is that there's a difference between us and Christ. God begat Jesus. God made us, but we're all connected. And God, made Je God begat Jesus for a reason, although uh, we're limited in our understanding of that. So one of the things that C.S. Lewis discusses, not just here, but, but in other places, is the limitations we have as human beings. And, and though we have uh, great intellectual powers, there's limitations to that. There's limitations to our environment also. We're here on this earth. Uh, you got to remember, that's just a speck in the universe, this earth is, and then we are just even smaller specks in this earth. So again, the real question is, what is it all about? And that's where Christianity comes in. That's where Christianity explains what is it all about and who am I and what is my place. So let's keep going. Now remember, this section is titled The First Steps in the Trinity. Okay? So what we're doing here is we are trying to understand the first steps in the doctrine of the Trinity. The Trinity is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So now we're going to come to this third entity, so to speak. This next section is called the three personal God. The last chapter was about the difference between begetting and making. A man begets a child, but he only makes a statue. God begets Christ, but he only makes men. By saying that, I've illustrated only one point about God, namely that what God the Father begets is God, something of the same kind as himself. In that way, it is like a human father begetting a human son, but not quite like it. So I must try to explain a little more. A good many people nowadays say, I believe in a God, but not a personal God. They feel that the mysterious something which is behind all other things must be more than a person. Now the Christians quite agree, but the Christians are the only people who offer any idea of what a being that is beyond personality could be like. All the other people though they say God is beyond personality and really think of Him as something impersonal, that is, as something less than personal. If you're looking for something super personal, something more than a person, then it is not a question of choosing between the Christian idea and the other ideas. The Christian idea is the only one on the market. It is only the Christians who have any idea of how human souls can be taken into the life of God and yet remain themselves. In fact, be very much more themselves than they warned you than they were before. I warned you that theological theology is practical. The whole purpose for which we can exist is to thus be taken into the life of God. Wrong ideas about what that life is will make it harder. So now we get beyond personality. God is bigger than that. God is bigger than a person, though he's, he is like a person. You know that in space you can move in three ways, to the left or right, backward or forwards, up or down. Every direction is either one, or one of these three or a compromise between them. They are called three dimensions. Now notice this. If you're only using one dimension, you could draw only a straight line. If you're using two, you could draw a figure, say a square. 
and the square is made up four straight lines. Now a step further, if you have three dimensions, you can then build what we call a solid body, a cube, a thing like a dice or a lump of sugar, and the cube is made up of six squares. Here's the point. A world of one dimension would be a straight line. In a two-dimensional world, you get straight lines, but many lines make one figure. In a three-dimensional world, you get figures, but many figures make one solid body. In other words, as you advance to more real and more complicated levels, you do not leave behind the things you found on the simpler level. You still have them, but combined in new ways, in ways you could not imagine if you only knew the simpler levels. Now, the Christian account of God involves just the same principle. The human level is simple and rather empty. On the human level, one person is one being, and any two persons are two separate beings, just as in two dimensions, say on a flat sheet of paper. One square is one figure, and any two squares are two separate figures. On the divine level, you still find personalities, but up there, you find them combined in new ways, which we, who do not live on that level, cannot imagine. In God's dimension, you find a being who is three persons while remaining one being just as a cube is six squares while remaining one cube. Of course, we cannot fully conceive a being like that. Just as if we were so made, we perceive only two dimensions in space. We can never properly imagine a cube. But we can get a sort of faint notion of it, and when we do, we are then, for the first time in our lives, getting some positive idea, however faint, of something super personal, something more than a person. It is something we could have never have guessed, and yet once we have been told, one almost feels one ought to have been able to guess it because it fits in so well with all the things we know. The thing that matters is being actually drawn into the three personal life, and they, that may begin at any time. What I mean is this. An ordinary, simple Christian kneels down to say his prayers. He's trying to get in touch with God. But if he is a Christian, he knows that what is prompting him to pray is also God. God, so to speak, inside him. But he also knows that all his real knowledge of God comes through Christ, the man who was God. That Christ is standing beside him, helping him to pray, praying for him. You see what is happening. God is the thing to which he is praying, the goal he is trying to reach. God is also the thing inside him which is pushing him on the motive power. God is also the road or bridge along which he has been pushed to that goal, so that the whole threefold life of the three-personal being is actually going on in that ordinary little bedroom where an ordinary man is saying his prayers. The man is being caught up into the higher kind of life, what I call Zoe, or spiritual life. He has been pulled into God by God while he still remains his self. And that is how theology started. People already knew about God in a vague way. Then came a man who claimed to be God, and yet he was not the sort of man you could dismiss as a lunatic. He made them believe him. They met him again after they had seen him killed. And then after they had been formed into a little society or community, they found God somehow inside them as well, directing them, making them able to do things they could not do before. And when they worked it all out, they found, found they had arrived at the Christian definition of the three-personal God. When you come to knowing God, the initiative lies on His side. If He does not show Himself, nothing you can do will enable you to find Him. And in fact, He shows much more of Himself to some people than others not because he has favorites, but because it is impossible for him to sow himself to a man whose whole mind and character are in the wrong condition. Just as sunlight, though it has no favorites, cannot be reflected in a dusty mirror as clearly as a clean one. The instrument through which you see God is your whole self. And if man's self is not kept clean and bright, his glimpse of God will be blurred like the moon seen through a dirty telescope. That is why horrible nations 
have horrible religions. They have been looking at God through a dirty lens. Consequently, the only really adequate instrument for learning about God is the whole Christian community waiting for Him together. Christian brotherhood is, so to speak, the technical equipment for this science, the laboratory outfit. That is why all these people who turn up every few years with some patent simplified religion of their own as a substitute for the Christian tradition are really wasting time. Like a man who has no instrument but an old pair of field glasses setting out to put all the real astronomers right. He may be a clever chap. He may be cleverer than some of the real astronomers, but he's not giving himself a chance. And two years later, everyone has forgotten all about him, but the real science is still going on. If Christianity was something we were making up, of course, we could make it easier, but it is not. We cannot compete in simplicity with people who are inventing religions. How could we? We're dealing with fact. Of course, anyone can be, a, be simple if he has no facts to bother about. All right, let's stop there. So again, what we see here is Dr. Lewis is bringing us to a point as individuals, where he wants us to understand things. He wants us to have a knowledge of God, but he also wants us to do something with it. So it's kind of like the map. You got a map, but to get anywhere, you have to take the map and use it. And that's kind of his idea of, of what he's doing here is explaining some theology the doctrine of the Trinity. And he wants to make the point how important it is. It's how important it is to us as individuals and also how important it is to us as a Christian community. Now, there's no small, um, there's no small feat in saying that within the Christian community is how we grow as Christians. It's going to be very difficult to get better I mean, to, to be a better Christian, to improve your life as a Christian without fellow Christians around you. First of all, you can see what excellence is because there's probably people in your Christian community that probably are further along in the walk. You can also see where you kind of are and you can help others who may be not, not as far in their walk. There's also corrective uh, behavior. Uh, where else can you know that you're not up to stuff than if you're in the major leagues? And that's, that's a kind of an example I want to make is that we want to grow and become mature Christians. And what better place to do that than in the major leagues, so to speak? If you stay in the little league, you might be good in the little league, but you'll never be a professional. Let's take this, and then there's another chapter that I'd like to kind of touch on lightly. It's called Time and Beyond Time. In this chapter, Dr. Lewis talks about God and our constraint of time. So uh, he basically says we're, we're living in a, in a world, in a, in a time-constrained world. This is what time is like. And of course, you and I tend to take it for granted that this time series, this arrangement of past, present, and future is not simply the way life comes to us, but the way all things really exist. We tend to assume that the whole universe and God himself are always moving on from past to future just as we do. But many learned men do not agree with that. It was the theologians who first started the idea that some things are not in time at all. Later, the philosophers took over, and now some of the physicists are doing the same. I might add, this is, this is physics 101, so to speak. Almost certainly, God is not in time. That's what you need to know there. God does not live in a time series at all. His life is not dribbled out moment by moment like ours. With him, it is, so to speak, 
still 1920 and already 1960, for his life is himself. So we could say it's not 1900 or 2030 or 40 or whenever, past, present, future. These, this idea is because of our limitation here in this life, we're limited in this time frame. Uh, and, and you might have experienced this in some of your other um, situations in learning also. You cannot fit Christ's earthly life in Palestine in any time relations with his life as God beyond all space and time. We, there, we imagine it is also a period in the history of God's own existence, this crucifixion, this Easter time. But God has no history. He is too completely and utterly real to have one. For, of course, to have a history means losing part of your reality because it slipped away into the past. The idea, this idea has helped Dr. Lewis, but he says, if it does not help you, leave it alone. It's a Christian idea in the sense that great and wise Christians have held it, and there's nothing in it contrary to Christianity. But it's not in the Bible or any of the creeds. You can be a perfectly good Christian without accepting it, or indeed without thinking of the matter at all. So, we end our lesson today with this thought. God is bigger than us. He's bigger than everything. God loves us. God sent His Son here for us. That's what we need to do. And His Son came here. He lived and taught us. He died. He rose. And now He lives in this world through us, His body. Thank you very much. Hope you have a good day. We'll be back with our next lesson.